Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the time for the very last panel discussion of uh, World of Freight Expo in Prague for 2022. It has been amazing two days. I hope you've enjoyed them both. And um, this is the time when uh, we will be a part of the very last panel discussion. And the topic is how to design a sustainable custom-made warehouse solution for e-commerce parcel boxes. So let's join us. Uh, because we will be welcoming on the stage our leading speaker and his guest. So let uh, me welcome on stage CCO of uh, World of Freight Group, uh, Mr. Christoph Grassl and his guests. And let's enjoy the last uh, panel discussion of the day. So the stage is yours. Hello, everybody. Great to see that we still have some interested participants for the last panel discussion of our two days event here in Prague of WOF Expo. And we are discussing now uh, one of the booming topics in our industry. We are talking about e-commerce, we are talking about fulfillment, we are talking about automation, uh, robotic solutions, and uh, how to implement uh, fulfillment centers. The great thing is that we are also on a live stream uh, today, so we can also greet hopefully some hundred people in front of the screens. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome from my side here to the stage. Um, would you be so kind and do a little introductory round, give us a little bit of your background, and uh, uh, then we right jump into uh, our discussion. Venusia, would you be so nice to start? Okay, uh, nice to see you. I'm proud to be your guest and uh, share a bit of my knowledge and expertise. Uh, I'm uh, working uh, almost 30 years in uh, operation supply chains management and uh, my uh, best professional career is uh, to uh, work with uh, holistic supply chain scope. That means how we manage the time, how we manage the money and uh, how we can eliminate uh, all the waste uh, through the processes in the philosophy of the lean supply chain management. So I hope that you will like my uh, comments and that will help you to see something more out of the tunnel and uh, problems that we are facing now with the turbulence in supply chains. Thank you very much. Andre, you want to continue? Uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm a VP of Marketing and Strategy at Brightpick. Uh, Brightpick is a automations provider. We automate end-to-end -end fulfillment uh, using state-of-the-art uh, autonomous mobile robots and robotic uh, piece-picking arms. We actually uh, prepared a short video that you can see our solution uh, live in a production environment. But our customers include e-commerce retailers, uh, grocers, here you can see uh, grocers, uh, third-party logistics companies. Actually, this is maybe 20 minutes away from here in Horni uh in a fulfillment center from Rohlik. Uh, you probably know them. They're, they're the largest online grocer uh, in Czech Republic. Uh, yes, that's <laughs> that is cat food probably. Um, but as you can see, we you know we, we can manage a very wide range of SKUs, uh, including previously unseen uh, items using artificial intelligence. You know, everything you see on the screen, the whole system, the moving robots, the robotic uh, picking arms is our own solution. Uh, and we're fully mobile based, so we don't require any fixed infrastructure, um, no conveyors, uh, which means that we can uh, go live in a very short uh, time span. I think, you know, th this was installed in a matter of weeks uh, at Rohleek. Uh, and it also means there's no single point of failure uh, and we can be very flexible. So um, um, I look forward to telling you more about it and, and our uh, experience. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me. My name is Rafielkova Kosorinska. Uh, for the last three years, I'm responsible for running an e-commerce fulfillment center in Hesaric, Slovakia. Uh, we do operate um, for 
videos serve for European markets with the fast fashion and uh, under our roof we do not only operate B2C model but also B2B meaning cross docking and night deliveries to brick and mortar stores. So thank you once again and looking forward to our discussion. Good afternoon everyone, I'm Gino Pacini, I'm regional channel manager for ProGlove. Uh, been with the company for about four years now and um, we are a market leader in uh, wearable scanning solutions. So um, we provide um, wearable scanners such as the ones you see in my hands today um, to the distribution industries, warehousing, logistics. Um, and of course, we, we grew out of the automotive industry. So that is uh, one of our specialty markets. Um, but we are completely sector agnostic. So we work with a variety of different um, applications. So um, anything you need in terms of uh, making your work more efficiency or processes more efficiency, um, feel free to try out uh, our scanners. Thank you very much for this introduction round. So we have already a little background about yourself. I think we have a great team here uh, on stage uh, with different, where we can have different aspects. Uh, what is important in a fulfillment center? What is important when we talk about e-commerce business? Very often, very fast-moving uh, e-commerce business uh, with very speedy requirements in handling. Uh, so maybe let's start at the very beginning. You know, we want to give our audience the um, seeing how to implement uh, a tailor-made solution uh, for uh, their e-commerce business, especially when we talk about parcels and so on. So maybe turning to Venusia uh, first, how how do you start? You know, you have a new customer there who is coming to you and says, uh, can you help me? Uh, I would like uh, to implement something. What are the first things you ask the customer? How do you kick it off? So mainly when I do uh, the projects uh, for my customers, I, I ask them where is their biggest problem. If they have problems with the space, if they have problems uh, with the money, or if they have problem with the service level to their customers. So based on these uh, key points, I really go with them through the processes and we try to manage uh, the most uh, impacted process. That means the most risks, most time, where is the problem sitting in the company. So to solve the issue. So in some, in some cases, we are focusing uh, on the solution like uh, smart technology or robotic warehouses. And in the end, it's just the end ribbon of the marathon because behind this uh, tiny mil milliseconds time that we are managing by the robotic uh, equipment, smart equipment, that we have uh, behind uh, months, uh, weeks of inventories, processes, that we don't uh, know, we are not aware, and it's really a big gap uh, that, uh, and space for improvement that we can help and uh, manage. Are there some general big issues uh, where you say in average there and there are the biggest issues, or is it all the time different? Every, everyone is different, everyone has different uh, environment, uh, processes, products, services, so it's unique per customer. And uh, always there is a space to help. Any, any type of the process where I can sit, it's always space uh, in time management, uh, inventory, uh, money flow, around 40%, 30-40%. So it's not uh, tiny money, it's big money, but uh, it's big uh, mental change uh, how to manage the processes. Thank you very much, uh, Andre. Uh, when we talk about robotics, when we talk about automation, I think, uh, or, or I would imagine that uh, that the entry level um, for new customer, it, it should be something bigger um, to to make this happen. Or how, how do you kick off these processes with your customers? Well, I, I think first it's important to understand what customers we serve. Um, so. You know, we really exclusively focus on fulfillment, not retail uh, replenishment or, or traditional warehousing. And, and the reason that is important is because fulfillment is a much more challenging application for our customers. So if you imagine, you know, 20 years ago when you have traditionally physical retail, you move typically cases or, or pallets 
uh, from the warehouse to the store, and then in the store they get distributed. So you're moving thousands of items at once. But now if you make an order online, someone actually has to pick the specific items you chose in the warehouse. Um, and that in and of itself is a much more challenging application because uh, A, it's more expensive because whereas you did the picking in the store yourself, now someone has to do it in the warehouse. And second, from an automation standpoint, it's, it's, much, it's much easier to manipulate with boxes or pallets than it is with individual items. So uh, basically what it ultimately comes down to is we only serve e-commerce customers or customers who sell through the online channel because that's where uh, online uh, picking uh, applies, uh, including e-grocers and, and third-party logistics companies. So assuming you know, a customer like that comes to us, there's really, we, we can go very small as well and very big. So I don't know if you're familiar with uh, micro-fulfillment centers. Uh, it's a relatively novel trend, particularly uh, within groceries, but also uh, logistics as a whole, where it's, you, you leverage existing retail space like back of store or dark stores even uh, to do fulfillment closer to the customer to cut that last mile travel distance. And there we're talking about really areas that are you know, as small as a thousand square meters. Um, and for us, the probably the smallest we can go is around, we, we, we do it based on picks. So 1,500 picks per shift would probably be the smallest we do. So you know, it depends on how many orders you have per, per average, or sorry, how many items you have per, per average order, uh, which affects the orders. But we've also gone very big. So our largest installation, uh, we did north of 100,000 picks uh, per day uh, during peak season. Um, so yeah. Wow, quite impressive. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Gino, would you like to add how, how you kick off this? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, it's quite interesting what he's talking about because uh, we, on, on the flip side, um, we're always trying to focus on, on the human element of, of the process. Uh, so although there is automation and, and, and we work uh, sometimes hand in hand with automation, for us, it's all, all focused on the human. We believe the human, uh, there's always a human element in part of the process. And, and for us, it's really about how do we make this human element as efficient as possible. Um, so that's where we came up with, um, with our wearable scanning solution. Um, grew out of the automotive industry, but um, slowly we saw, of course, it had uh, a lot more applications, um, in particularly in the logistics sector. Um, so fulfillment uh, is, is obviously uh, one to look at. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely growing. It's definitely really segmented as well. Um, and it's interesting to see how we also work hand in hand together with automations because for some use cases, um, it makes a lot of sense, but for others, um, the efficiency gains that you're that we're gaining on one end, um, on the other side, we have to wait um, for the automotive process uh, to catch up with us and vice versa. So it really depends on the use case, um, but um, for a variety of applications, it's quite interesting to see us working hand in hand uh, with automation. Yeah, co combination uh, and somewhere there is always automation, human workforce, and it has to work hand in hand. Uh, and then we are coming back to the processes. The overall process has to work pretty well. So, Suara, this is your day-to-day -day business, right? Yeah. You are in this every day in the fulfillment, taking care about it, handling the action. So when you kick it off and you do and start a new uh, project and you build up a fulfillment center, what are your key issues? Okay, uh, it was a uh, very challenging time starting of begin begin beginning to, uh, of the year 2020. When um, we started the operations, we launched the, let's say, we, we, we fulfilled the first customer's order at the end of January and then in uh, February and in March COVID came and dramatically the amount of the ordered stock uh, increased. So my biggest challenge was to plan the capacities, plan the manpower on site, and also settle a great relationships with the last mile uh, delivery uh, service providers inside, on site. Um, I had to plan the 
uh, workload based on the amount of customers ordered, taking account into account what does the customer really needs and, and wants, and in fast fashion, customer wants it fast, and the experience of the, of the whole um, clothing item, including the packaging, has to be great. So I built up the um, operations based on uh, next, uh, the next business day delivery model. Uh, simultaneously at the outbound, I had to also plan the inbound, taking into consideration that I have to inbound more than I uh, outbound it in order to be always available online. The more you offer, the more you sell. Taking into consideration last mile delivery providers, I had to build up uh, the relationships with the most suitable carrier forms and hubs that logically built the network so that I could cover next business day delivery. Same with the reverse logistics. So it was very demanding. It was only partially uh, automated when it comes to the level of atom automation in our fulfillment center. Then in a couple of months, we started the automation. I will be uh, speaking more about it. But so it learned, it, it learned me a lot. E-commerce is about, um, and non-stop changes and adapting to customers' needs. And you have to be fast, faster and faster every day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I, I would like to add uh, to uh, Zora's uh, e-commerce business. So we have looked uh, to each other products uh, to discuss uh, correctly. So I have also looked at uh, what is uh, Zora business and uh, uh, from my uh, real-time uh, visibility of the global supply chain, we have agreed that uh, it's big potential also for e-commerce. So Sora is sourcing from uh, Asia, Asia, US, other continents uh, of the world. But she is placing order and expecting that uh, the fulfillment would be on time uh, as expected. So what is my solution offering? It's the real-time visibility. So the supplier has uh, seen the order. The supplier has uh, built the order. It's on the sea, it's on the road to Europe. It's uh, in consignment stock, or it's uh, in external warehouse, internal warehouse, even how many parts uh, or uh, clothes or stuff uh, that is on e-commerce in is in the shelves. So we can have this uh, real-time overview. And uh, you guys are really the uh, cherry on the cake that uh, you are supporting the solution by fast action for the users. So you support the users by ProGlav, fast transactions, and you are even able to replace the users. So you eliminating the times uh, into minimum. And I. I give the visibility to, to end users, that means the human person who makes uh, the decision, who supports the end customer needs to give an answer. So I am giving to the really physical person user the overview of the global supply chains, where are the roadblocks, uh, where uh, we have the problems, uh, where we are stacking, or if my supplier has a problems to fulfill my orders. So I have really a lot of time uh, from uh, from Asia or other continent, maybe two two months in advance to make some action to correct the supply chain before it hits my shelves uh, in the supermarkets. So. Interesting point. The earlier you start with the planning, the easier it comes afterwards. Uh, um, you know, we said e-commerce. The, the requirements are really, sometimes it's shooting up, uh, the fluctuations in the business can be very high, like the pre-Christmas season and so on in the fulfillment. Um, to, to adjust this and also we wanted to give a little learning to new companies in the business, to startup uh, companies. And before we go into further details of the fulfillment process itself, um, is there something where you can say you can show again a new customer on talking now to the guys regarding automation processes and so on, 
uh, you have a return on investment, uh, you can show them return on investment cases, because th I think that's a pretty challenging thing for a startup. Should they invest in this one? Should they invest in that one? What to touch first? What makes sense? Uh, what will really help them? Um, how do you deal with these kind of situations? I'm happy to take this one. Uh, as you can imagine, it's a very complicated question to answer because there's a lot of factors behind it. So, uh, you know, we, we work closely with customers uh, from the very beginning. There's a lot of data sharing. Ultimately, we build, we build a, you know, very large and complex model which spits out the answer. Um, but I think, you know, conceptually, if you buy automation outright, or at least for our customers, what we've seen, you have in Western economies paybacks as short as one to two years on your investment. Obviously in you know, Eastern economies where wages are a bit lower, that can extend by one or two years. And I think uh, perhaps you're familiar with an another sales model called robots as a service, where instead of selling the outright solution as a CapEx investment on, for our customer, we basically lease it uh, for a monthly subscription fee where we own the robots, we you know, pay for the robots, for the assets, for the installation, and in return we get a monthly fee from our customers. But what this allows the customers to do is basically achieve an ROI on day one. Uh, because the, value is pro the value proposition is, you know, it continues to be an operating cost, and we can cut your cost by you know, 50%, for example. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say ROI is not the main blocker for our customers. It's more all the other factors that Zora also mentioned in terms of the trade-offs and the flexibility, and we can speak about that later. Yeah, no, for us it's, um, well, I mean, it really depends on the use case at the end of the day. Um, so we, you know, every industry sector is different, every use case is different, but um, we do have an ROI tool, of course, that um, we go through um, to, together with the end user. Um, we input um, a series of different metrics. Um, so typically the key ones are always the labor cost um, is a key element. Um, also um, the number of scans uh, that you're doing uh, per shift as well. Um, but there's also an element to our produ product that's also in the ergonomic side. So um, it's only, it's less than 40 grams. Uh, so it's 100% human centric uh, product. The way we designed it, uh, everything, it's, it's all with the human at the center. Um, so, so yeah, so I mean, at the end of the day, it's less than one year for most of the use cases, uh, but you also have this um, ergonomic factor on top as well, which is quite key for us. Thank you very much. So, uh, Swara, you, you operate some automation and robotic systems in your warehouses. So what, what are your uh, experiences? Okay, so for the last one year, uh, I have been uh, building up a sorting solution together with uh, conveyors and uh, so-called shoe sorter. Um, first of all, um, experience, uh, the return of investment of such a huge device is five years in our uh, fulfillment center, and the cost em elimination is up to 30%. Uh, based on this automation, uh, I optimize the workforce in the in the uh, facility, and um, we changed completely. I changed completely the logic of picking the orders and sorting them, of picking the items, the individual indexes into into orders. Before there was a lot lots of redundant uh, movement all around the warehouse. The pickers were picking based on the solution of based on the, on the order that, that they, they have had in their palm tops after uh, implementation of the automated solution. There is a picking snake that is picking uh, randomly the pieces to order batches, meaning uh, randomly picking uh, saves uh, time, saves labor, and uh, the, the costs too. Uh, the uh, sorting according to customer's order is done based on uh, logarithms in the, in the uh, sorting system of this automation. Um, once orders are sorted and unloaded from the device, they are packed and put on conveyor belts on which there is a posi sorter camera uh, using uh, uh, AI 
um, and reading the barcodes, this POSI sorter, so-called shoe sorter, um, orientates the um, uh, boxes towards the shoots for uh, uh, dedicated carriers and countries. So overall, I was able to um, optimize the manpower in, I think, 20%. And uh, the return of investment, we see, I see on monthly basis that I am able to reduce certain costs in 30%. So it's, so it's great. And you know, the robots and the automation systems don't need to take vacations. They are not sick. <laughs> they are able to work 24 seven. So it's the, it's the present and future of the e-commerce. And also um, implementing uh, returns uh, strategy, returns processing, all together with the system of uh, fulfilling uh, click and collect orders that's omnichannel, that's another uh, topic to discuss on. I can discuss about it for three hours. That's the, that's the uh, present and the future of the shopping itself. Someone wants to add to the Sora's concept? Uh, for my side, uh, to get uh, the global overview in real time, the concept of uh, integrated combat system is based on cloud, it's software solution. And uh, uh, for you, uh, the, the minimum package is uh, 300 euro per month. And you can grow across the packages as your process is growing. So if uh, we take the benefits uh, that you integrate your ERP system, you integrate your third part logistics, uh, you integrate your uh, suppliers, customers, you integrate your smart technologies. That means uh, in the current stage, we are 100% paperless process. So there are no human entry. Uh, so we can eliminate all the human work. And if we compare the return of investment of 300 euro per month uh, for minimum five users, so it's less than the, the time they spent on uh, phone or emails to communicate their daily job. So I can, I can confirm that uh, the payback uh, with the logic that you can grow with the system and extend the system with the price, uh, it's paid by minutes. So it's not such a heavy like uh, invest uh, and get approval for a robotic cell or for these big uh, machines and uh, return of investments of months. It's really a fast solution that you can get under control your money, your inventory, your flow in minutes with the return immediately. Yeah, just to add on to that, um, for us, we, we also have a, an overview of, of our processes um, in that sense. Uh, we've added, we've tapped on the software side a little bit uh, because we really wanted uh, customers to have a full view um, on exactly how much they're scanning, um, the intervals between scans, uh, how fast they're scanning, uh, where they're moving along the shop floor, um, where the devices are at any given time. Um, there's also an element to a product that um, it deals with errors. So we talked about return on investment. Um, we have a feature called worker feedback across all of our scanners, which basically provide the operator a series of different uh, lighting patterns, uh, haptic uh, uh, and acoustic sounds. Um, it'll let them know basically if what they've picked is correct, for example, just simple positive negative feedback. But equally, um, exactly where to put the next pick, where to put what they've picked or where to drop it off. Um, so that's all part of, um, you know, errors that can be easily avoided. And that's something that it's obviously hard uh, from an RI standpoint to put a figure on it. But um, it's one that is, is definitely needs to be taken into consideration when you implement uh, our, our products as such. Um, so yeah, so with our program insight, um, it really allows the, the end user to get a full view um, of what's happening uh, with regards to, to the scanning. And, and it is really um, uh, versatile because it also allows you to deploy certain configurations. So let's say you want certain prefixes and suffixes to be added on to what you're scanning. You can easily deploy that either to one scanner or to a group of scanners. So from that point, it also you know, allows more flexibility to the user. Maybe I would be also curious to hear from Zoya. What are the challenges that you faced when you implemented your sort of conveyor-based automation solution? Yes. First of all, it's a good, robust 
warehouse management system to have and to be able to communicate between our site warehouse management system and the supplier's automation system. There has to be a um, good, um, relevant and uh, no back flow of information. Uh, the index from my warehouse management system is paired with the sorting device using RFID technology. Uh, so there can be lots of system obstacles. So this is the first challenge. Second is the nature of the goods is itself. For some of the um, uh, items, for some of the indexes in our fulfillment center, the sorting device is not suitable because of their dimensions and weight, like home accessories, for example, because we do sort not only fast fashion and clo clothes and shoes, but and accessories, but also home decor. And uh, what else? Um, to have a good help desk. Uh, being able to log in tickets and solve in uh, in uh, in seconds in our case because uh, the fulfill the e-commerce fulfillment is about 24/7 operations so that's it. I am uh, in uh, I am I have been using this sorting and conveyor device for more than one year and I'm still in the ramp up phase to be honest, but it's completely normal also in automotive industry and in, in other industries so it's quite challenging yes. How would you respond to this? <laughs> no, I mean, I think these are all very good points. And, and I think as Gino said as well, ultimately, most automation solutions uh, are, or any sort of automation is a matter of trade-offs. Uh, and the single biggest trade-off uh, when you replace human labor with uh, automation is the flexibility that you lose uh, inside your warehouse. And I think, you know, I actually, the reason I asked, and b because I think Conveyor is a very good example of this, where on the one hand, it's a very sort of proven and, and easy to understand solution. It's just, you know, moving floor with a few nuts and bolts. Um, on the flip side, y it requires a lot of software integration because you still need, it doesn't actually automate the picking process itself. So you need to integrate with the human pickers who then put the items on the conveyor and so forth. and then. You know, you mentioned a five-year payback and, and also the sort of rapidly changing uh, dynamics of e-commerce. Uh, we've seen time and again with, with many automation technologies where customers very enthusiastically adopt them uh, only to find out three years later that they need a different use case for them. Um, and I think, you know, not, not to sit here and, and, and pitch bright pick, this isn't the point, but I think, you know, when we were designing the solution from the very beginning, we had this sort of flexibility point in mind. And, and ultimately, that's why we went with a mobile robotics platform. So a, a core tenet of our philosophy is that we require zero fixed infrastructure. So everything you saw in the video is, is fully mobile based. Uh, you know, it works with standard commodity, industry standard totes and, and, and racks. So I would say, you know, at least half of our customers already had them in their warehouse when we started serving them. And then basically what, what that allows you to do is you can easily reconfigure uh, the warehouse if your needs change. So if you have different items, if you wanna change the picking area, if you wanna increase throughput, all you need to do is add another mobile robot uh, during peak season, which was one of your questions as well. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of going there one day, adding more robots and plugging them into the software logic um, and, and, and so forth. And so ultimately, yes, it's still going to be less flexible than human, uh, but keep in mind, we also eliminate 95% of, of uh, labor required uh, with our, our solution. Uh, and, and the one that we sort of don't uh, automate is, is sort of picking the unpickable items like bananas or uh, sort of frozen goods or, or items that are too big or too heavy. Uh, you, you can, you know, in that video you saw the, the robots pulling up to the robotic arm, it can just as easily pull up to a human and ask the human to do the pick instead, right? And it's that sort of flexibility that we always try to 
sort of uh, p pitch to our customers ultimately. And that's also what allows us to sell via ro robots as a service. Because if you have a conveyor uh, or a shuttle-based solution or, or something like AutoStore, for example, you know, you're building you know, a, a five, six, 10 meter tall structure uh, that ultimately you can't reconfigure, you can't move, uh, and that means you need to actually buy it upfront. Whereas with us, we can move the robots from one customer to another, we can add more robots to one customer, take them away, and the customer only pays for what they actually use. Um, so. Pretty interesting. Chino, you are more on the human side, you said, right? And uh, it's already in your company name, uh, Broglove, uh, without the glove. I mean, you need a human who is having the glove, right? Uh, uh, without that, it doesn't really work. So uh, we heard a lot uh, from Andre about the automation, about taking out 95% uh, of the human uh, workforce in, in an, a fulfillment process. Um, how would you react to this? Yeah, I think what we in Proglov, we say that there's a, there's a saying, and I think it's, uh, I can mirror maybe Elon Musk and the Teslas of this world when they say that excessive automation was, um, was to some extent a problem. So humans uh, are undermined uh, sometimes, uh, and I believe it's the case also, and especially now with my time at Proglov, it can be seen more and more. Um, but most of the process that you see, there's always a, a human involved at some point of the process. So um, um, I'm not saying uh, nothing against automation. Uh, I think automation is great. Um, um, but I think some of the keywords that were just recently used were flexibility. So, um, you know, how flexible do you need your processes to be? Um, what exactly um, do you need a robot uh, to, to do when? And what if something goes wrong? Um, you know, do you have to stop the whole operation to, to really regroup and readjust? Uh, and, and those are things that, um, where you really take the human, uh, you know, for granted sometimes. So um, human is also good, uh, but we need to, to add uh, an additional layer of technology, which is kind of um, uh, where we come in with, uh, with our products. So, yeah, I mean, nothing against automation. We work great. Um, we, I think um, it's um, future-wise, if you look at it from a, you know, a couple of years ahead, it's really about how we start working together uh, with automation and, and humans and, and what is the right fit, uh, what is the, the right, where's the right balance, where do we draw the line and that's going to be kind of more I think the question going forward and I speak for myself but I think uh, most of company in Proglav has a similar viewpoint I would say. And I, I would agree with what G Gino said as well, Th there are certain processes inside a warehouse that shouldn't be automated. Uh, not even because they can't be, but because it doesn't make economic sense to do so, or the solution that, that would automate them would be too expensive. And, and ultimately, you know, we're not in the business of selling automation for automation's sake. Uh, we're in the business of cutting costs for our customers. Um, I think if there's one, you know, KPI that any customer would agree on or, or would, would share, it, it's cost per pick. Uh, and that's ultimately what we try to minimize. And as Gino said, there are certain cases where that minimum cost per pick is achieved uh, by the human. On the flip side, I would also say that, especially in sort of more advanced economies like the US, Germany, you know, these are, th there's a real lack of labor for these kinds of jobs uh, because they're physically challenging jobs. They require a lot of walking, they require a lot of uh, physical work, effort, and ultimately they're not very exciting. They're not very intellectually stimulating. Um, and especially in, in today's tight labor market, uh, you know, our, our customers are really struggling uh, to find employees to do the work for them. And you have to keep in mind that, you know, the share of e-commerce, even post-COVID, is only going to continue growing. And for every, let's say, uh, whatever, 1% penetration uh, of uh, e-commerce within retail, that exponentially increases the number of picks you need to do for that exact reason that I spoke about early on. So it's not just a matter of, oh, you do, you know, 1% more e-commerce, so you need 1% more warehouses. It's more like you need, you have 1% more e-commerce, so you need, you know, 20% more warehouses because all of those picks are happening inside of those, those warehouses now. And, you know, just to close my thought, I think I, I, I read uh, just yesterday, in the US, it costs $8,500 to replace a warehouse associate. If you include all the lost productivity, the hiring costs, the training costs, uh, costs to hire, and so forth, it's $8,500.
I mean, there's your ROI. It's almost immediate. That, that's true. I would say also, uh, okay, automation, but also in our site there are some functions, some, some uh, operations we cannot perfor perf perform fully automated, like for example processing of returns. There is no so developed artificial intelligence yet to distinguish if uh, a returned t-shirt is dirty where is it dirty if the dirt can be, uh, let's say, repaired and pu put back to stock and sold again, or to be isolated and put to defects or to outlet section. So yes, I, I agree with you. Some processes remain and will remain for a certain period of time completely um, depending on human know-how and human intelligence. Ret returns, I think we touch here a pretty important topic in the e-commerce uh, industry, right? Uh, I mean, there is a high percentage of returns, so uh, all obviously in the fulfillment center, in the processes in the fulfillment centers, uh, to deal with the returns, what are from a financial perspective just a pain, um, so it should be also very efficient. Um, are there also from the returns perspective, uh, similar to what Sora just said, is there some experience from one of the other panelists? So from my side, uh, we have uh, customers that are doing the spare parts uh, for auto services. And uh, there is really requirement that the serviceman is asking for the list of spare parts that will be maybe needed for the replacement but in the end, they are not consumed. So we have uh, the step that it could be picked uh, for the servicemen. It's still hanging in the picking form. And when they finish the, uh, the service, they consume the parts that has been uh, replaced and they can return back to the main warehouse the parts that has not been uh, consumed in the service. So yes, the returns are really part of the business flow and uh, we must work with them. I would add, um, before the, the automation was implemented, all of the returns processed and uh, evaluated by a return worker that, okay, this piece can be put back to stock and sold again, were uh, intaken to stock by regular put away process which was time consuming and also manpower consuming. Now all the uh, suitable SKUs that are returned are um, put into uh, the automation system. There is one certain area of our automation where the returns are stored and for example if it's one or last piece to add to a customer's order, um, up to 80, 85% of them are sold again within next 24 hours, which is fantastic for us. So this, uh, this um, particular automation in my fulfillment center helped uh, uh, moving returns much faster than before. And uh, I, I would say even for us, basically the process that Zora described. So we can take, uh, once the human processes the, the return, uh, those same mobile robots can come take the tote and, and, and put it back into replenishment, back into storage. Um, so that's actually you know on our product roadmap for next year. Um, but keep in mind that you know 80% of sort of the, the warehouse costs or, or time spent is on walk-in. So, you know, having that human sort of look at the item in a sort of stationary spot uh, is not actually that big of a problem. But if you can manage to cut the time, the, anyone, a person needs to walk to the aisle, put it into to the tote, and, and, and sort of uh, store the item again, that, that's a huge cost savings potential. Yeah, I, just to add on to that, um, I think there's one element that uh, that we may be slightly forgetting is that for every, a lot of these returns are not just returns, right? They're exchanges, uh, particularly in, in e-com and retail. So that's a whole other process that, that needs to take place because then, then the whole chain starts to a certain extent from scratch again, right? So 
I think, um, yeah, for, for, and, and, and people are requiring more and more flexibility nowadays. Um, they want things quicker. Uh, they want more uh, flexibility when they get items, particularly in e-com. So um, I think it's, uh, it's not just the volume that, um, that you're outputting at, at a first glance. Uh, everything pretty much starts, uh, you know, from scratch the moment that somebody asks for an exchange. So that's a key part of the whole return process as well. And obviously, with the flexibility of your systems, both processes can be integrated. Absolutely. And um, again, with um, a lot of these, is we, we, we use uh, our scanners a lot for, for retail, particularly product exchanges. Uh, you see it, we work with, um, um, with some large uh, North American retailers as well, which have seen uh, substantial uh, gains with in, in productivity. So a lot of them deal with exchange, typical brick and mortars, putting orders together, uh, bringing orders apart, uh, checking the orders for quality and putting them back on the rack. So um, yeah, absolutely every second counts. And of course, the more operators you have, uh, you multiply it by number of seconds, uh, you know, it obviously quantifies to, to a large number at the end of the year. Thank you very much. Um, you want to add, Lelusha? Yeah, just uh, for the Gino that we did talk uh, about the possibility to really cooperate uh, together, because I really see big potential uh, for uh, ProGlove uh, to be used, because we have everything in real time. So if uh, the truck is leaving, for example, the consignment stock or uh, kitting center or some space that is just uh, 20 minutes drive, uh, we can uh, have this uh, integrated with our solution. That means the glove would be like a username, password with the rules, uh, restrictions that are available for the user. So whatever who, who has it uh, on, uh, on the hand, it's known like the person who is uh, approved to do the receiving. And because uh, the ProGlove has three uh, screens that uh, could offer uh, the person okay, I have this item, I confirm this item, it has been received. So it's, it's nice for me to really participate in this discussion and have the opportunity to discuss. Uh, the, the second is if we have the milk runs or deliveries uh, for supermarkets around uh, the shop floors, uh, or it could be the picking uh, the parcel in uh, e-commerce, uh, we have the list that they should be picked and uh, the glove should be the picker. So we can have really uh, defined the glove like a user and no, nobody has to be fixed. There are no rules uh, of uh, user accounts. The user would be the glove. So we really can uh, integrate and make uh, all this uh, smart technology even smarter for the end users. Wow, smart technology even smarter. We are skyrocketing on the smartness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, one topic what we touched slightly already, uh, and uh, we still have a couple of minutes, so I, I would like to address it, is the actual human resource situation. I mean, uh, we know overall the pandemic situation, uh, partly in Central Eastern Europe, also, of course, uh, the crazy war in the Ukraine, uh, from Russia at the moment, uh, so some kind of, I heard from Poland that uh, some Ukraine workers uh, left the country, went back to the Ukraine, fighting there now, and not um, truck drivers, warehouse workers. So, so sort of what is the situation in your uh, fulfillment centers from a, a human source, resource side? I have a third party provider, so. Um, together with the, the manager of third party provider, uh, I have a production plan in front of me, establishing and having core personnel and agency personnel. Core, po core personnel is like less than one third of the whole personnel needed for the operations and there is a variable part, which is uh, uh, agency. Yes, it's very hard taking into consideration the surroundings of the fulfillment center. There are other fulfillment centers. There is a lack of personnel, not only in our site, which we are covering by um, agencies, especially, yes, Ukrainians, but also Serbian and Moldavians workers. So Serbians, because of the language proximity, 
are able to work quite quite uh, flexibly. So partially you are right, that's, that's a phenomenon, but it can be covered by temporary agency staff. So basically you outsource the problem uh, to a third party uh, uh, yeah. provider who is helping you with and this. And this third party provider also is responsible for the stock accuracy for you know um, any manco that is uh, in the inventory and also for the health and safety of the workers and the whole security of the area the con the contract is built that way so it's beneficial for my situation how, how high is the fluctuation that I may ask fluctuation mm. The work is not that, let's say, uh, physically demanding than in, for example, automotive industry. So the fluctuation is not that high. Like, for example, in um, in um, mm. cement or beton uh, plant that is also in the area. <laughs> uh, so it's not that huge. There were some uh, Ukrainians that already left the country, Slovakia, and came back to Ukraine. I can I cannot define by percentage, but uh, especially the root employees, the, the the main employees of the third party provider are with us for three years since the startup of the project, so we are quite okay. Uh, are you seeing wage inflation? Wage inflation? Yes, I do. I do experience it, uh, but I I don't have I I am not touching this because of the contract with my third party provider. What about the training new people, you know, on your systems, on the processes? Mm -hmm. How fast are you to uh, have them working properly? Yeah. yeah, first of all, it was so called train the trainer. We trained the trainers for uh, all specific parts of the logistic process. And once there is a newcomer coming, there is a, let's say, a so called body that shows him or her the uh, processes to, to do. Honestly, in an um, e-commerce fulfillment, those processes are not so evaluated when it comes to knowledge or know-how or intelligence, depends on which. Uh, so uh, a worker works with her, his or, or her body, and in uh, 24 hours, the worker is able to work autonomous, autonomously with, wow. with scanners, with palm tops, with the, with the automation. Wow, that's pretty fast. Uh, Gino, what is your experience? How fast do the people adopt to your system uh, when you implement it and you tell them, okay, how fast is a new employee who has never seen uh, 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 equipment from you? Yeah, so the, the learning curve for a product is quite simple, right? It's a, almost a plug and play solution. Uh, so there's not a lot um, that, uh, in terms of learning curve, it's pretty user friendly. Uh, it's as, as I said earlier, it's human centric. So uh, at the end of the day, it's um, you know a quick learning curve. Uh, there's um, it was designed that way as well. So um, there's not a lot of um, ad additional things that, that that were put into the process. But we do have a display uh, um, scanner as well. So um, we've um, we've designed it basically to provide the worker with as much feedback as possible on the back of the hand. Um, and, and to simplify things as well so that they don't have to use a companion device or go through um, a series of different applications um, that they need to look at in detail. But yeah, I mean, that's, um, that's the beauty of, uh, of our product, that they're very simplistic, it's robust, uh, but at the same time, it doesn't require you know, a lot of learning curve uh, to actually adapt to it. Uh, but a lot of the workers, I must say, um, they are, um, some, some of them are really used to the old habits, so it takes, uh, a little bit for them to actually get used to uh, new ways of working, even though it's more efficient uh, at the time. Um, but ultimately, I wouldn't say there's a really long uh, learning curve. All right. Maybe as the last round, a little bit future outlook. What can we expect uh, in, let's say, not the next 10, 20 years, but in the next uh, two, three years uh, in the industry? What kind of trends do you see out of your experience, out of your companies? What is, what is awaiting us next? So I will, I will take as a first. Uh, I, I think uh, that uh, we will be all inspired by e-commerce. 
so I am really seeing this with my children, that uh, everything must be on the mobile. They are not going to the computer. Everything must, must be available on one click. So the speed and availability would be the key. And uh, to have uh, the flow correctly running, I, I mean that the supply chain and the partners in the supply chain need to cooperate with each other and share the information that we are not is isolated cells, uh, that we all must be uh, really connected, uh, doesn't matter what platform, but uh, I think that the cooperation across the globe would be the way out of this uh, turbulence uh, times. I would say from a robotic standpoint, COVID was a wake up call to, to many customers that uh, they need automation, not just because of social distancing and so forth, but because of the boom in e-commerce we saw during during COVID and, and many uh, online retailers struggling to, to, to meet the demand. Um, and I think, you know, automation is the future. Uh, whether it's uh, further enabling humans with automated processes like Gino or, the, or entirely replacing uh, certain human processes with, with robots. But the fact of the matter is that if you want to stay competitive uh, and profitable, uh, you need to adopt it. Otherwise, you're going to become a dinosaur. I would say omnichannel fulfillment from stores. Uh, omnichannel and fulfillment stores meaning uh, integration of uh, the e-commerce and of my warehouse management system with the other uh, systems in uh, brick and mortar so that uh, once the customer places the order and I don't have the material in uh, my facility a nearby shop has to be able to fulfill the order and uh, send by a last mile delivery service carrier. It is already happening and uh, delivery to uh, pickup stores and pickup points such as Paketa, for example. It has become more and mo more popular and uh, we also push the marketing and the sales to uh, divert as many of the orders to uh, local uh, packet stores and uh, pickup points so that uh, we are as close to the customer as possible. When you see a feedback, for example, on Facebook that I ordered, um, on Wednesday I, I ordered the clothes for a, at an event, on Friday it arrived and on Saturday I was at the event and the, clo and the clothes were fantastic thanks to, thanks to the, your company. It, was, uh, it, is the, it is the feedback I need to understand what the customer needs and will need in the next two, three years. Exactly as you say, network, omnichannel, the frost from stores, fulfillment from stores. Yeah, for me, I, I can go on this topic um, <laughs> quite extensively, uh, but uh, if I were to summarize it, and maybe it overshadows a lot of what the other panelists have said, um, is uh, maybe speed, flexibility, and, and adaptability going forward. Uh, so, um, you know, how quick you can turn products over, how quick your processes can be, um, how flexible they are, people are expecting more and more flexibility. As she was saying, you know, one click, uh, everything is now one click. The younger generation um, expects that. Uh, so, and then also adaptability, you know, um, we want to make sure workers are, are learning how to use products uh, really quickly, are adapting to new processes really quickly. Um, so you, you need to really keep up with these three um, elements uh, and that's gonna be key going forward. Thank you very much. So time is running very fast. Thanks a lot for being on stage. Our 55 minutes are gone, but still I would like to take the chance if you would like to give, you know, a last final statement, key takeaway you want to give to the audience for e-commerce fulfillment. So uh, I mean, uh, if the last and the biggest statement, uh, everywhere is time, time is equal to resources, that we need to cover the time and the resources are equal to the money. So if you will look uh, for money to free up in your processes, look for the time that you are spending in each single process. I would keep it simple. Uh, Brightpick is the best automation solution on the market. So if you want to save money, uh, come to us. Come to us. 
Uh, I would say mm, know your customer, speak with your customer, know exactly what he or she wants, and uh, you have to adapt to that in order to survive. And I would say basically if you're looking for efficient ways to, to make the human part of the process uh, as efficient as possible, come to us uh, and trial our products uh, and, um, and see how we can help. Thank you very much. It was great spending some time with you here on the stage. Thanks a lot for your insights and I hope we could give a lot of learnings to the audience and uh, thanks for being with us at WOF Expo Prague. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.